morning, uh, guys. This uh, Wednesday teaching is uh, very kindly presented by uh, Prof. Kader, the Ari Kader. Uh, he's uh, quite uh, well known. Um, it will make, take me half an hour to introduce him really fully, but just briefly tell you about him. He's a consultant um, from London. He's worked in the UK for many years. Um, he has many activities, professional activities, but um, he, he has a charity activities in the UK and abroad, um, the Middle East. He also, if you move on to his uh, academic profile, he has published more than 100 uh, peer-reviewed publications. He has edited many books. Um, some of them are directly of RCS relevant, such as these two books. I think um, most of you, if not all of you, know these books very well, but, you know, including me, the, you know, I've read all the editions. This is the third edition of the postgraduate orthopedics, and I've experienced all editions, excellent books, the Viva book. There's another book, Viva book coming very soon. Um, and also he runs FRCS courses. We're very, very well recommended. I think um, also a lot of you attended. I attended some of these. And the next one, there is one in the UK in October. Um, and uh, one overseas also coming in uh, January next year. So these are all recommended. And uh, so basically, uh, Prof. Kader is, you know, has a wealth of knowledge. And I think we're very privileged to have him with us tonight. Uh, please make the best of his, uh, best of his uh, presence with us. Um, ask you questions. Um, raise your queries. And he, he's, he, he will do his best, I'm sure, to help you guys. Um, obviously, as you know, if anyone has a question, just raise your hand, the hand symbol next to your name. And I will pass on your question uh, to Prof. Uh, Kader. So over to you, uh, Prof. Please. Okay. So good evening. You need to show me what to do, though. <laughs> yeah. Share okay. screen now. Share screen in the okay. bottom. We've done that. And uh, there we go. So I can still see my. Yeah. Excellent. So good evening, everyone. Um, this hopefully will be uh, one of uh, few. Uh, seminars I'm going to give them. So Faraz was uh, very clever uh, by asking me to do this. I was not sure what I've been signing into. He just uh, asked me to do it and I, because I like him, I said yes. Now I realize there is more into it than just, you know, talking to a few people. So never mind, we will continue doing it. And I hope that this talk will be just an introductory, but in the future, this talk is going to be about patella instability. Uh, some of it will be um, exam related, majority of it, but there are certain things which you probably benefit for, for your clinical practice too. So it is, um, I wouldn't say 100% exam focused. The exam questions are so variable. Some centers you get examined, you will find that there are a lot of uh, patellofemoral related cases. Some others, you will just find all of it is metal work and arthroplasty and things which are, you know, just completely different from day-to-day -day, uh, work. So it's very much dependent where you work for the web, where the exam is and what clinical cases are available. But uh, needless to say, this is also an important part of the exam. And it is, um, it's important for you to know these things. Now, I work for in a few places, as uh, Faraz introduced me, uh, and uh, these are the places I work at and I work at. So, Swalio, I work with the Red Cross in Lebanon, and I work uh, with a few charities in Iraq. Now, patella stability, the actual stability of the patella, is very much a complex interaction, and it is between soft tissue, homeostasis, bone morphology and overall alignment of the leg. Now you can see that the, in the first 30 degrees of movement, the uh, stability of the patella very much dependent on the soft tissue. After that, it is dependent on the bone morphology. Of course, alignment affects that at different levels. Now these are the main causes of instability. So of course, in the in, in exam setting, people don't ask you what are the causes of patella instability because the exam is not there to uh, test your memory. It's there to test your, the depth of thinking you have and how thorough you are 
and how analytic you are. So, but if you don't know these things, then you have no hope in progressing. You have to keep these things in the back of your mind and be able to apply them to clinical practice. So there are soft tissue reasons, there are bony reasons, there are alignment and gait, all affect stability of the patella. Now, acute patella dislocation is a controversial thing. And 20 years ago, there was no controversy. Everybody who dislocated their patella people would put them in a, um, a plaster for six weeks. I've done that multiple times when I was an SHO. But nowadays, things have moved on. And we first, if we treat them conservatively, we treat them conservatively for a shorter period of time, which is a couple of weeks in a splint, just to rest and mobilize as soon as possible. Of course, there are a, a subgroup of those people who dislocate their, their, their patella. They have different problem because they have multiple anatomical factors wrong with them. And this group, which is a smaller group, may benefit from intervention. So if somebody asks you how would you treat an acute patella dislocation, you would say it is conservative for a short period of time but there are some groups who may benefit from surgical intervention. That's an answer nobody can argue with. If, however, somebody dislocates their patella more than once, which is two times and above, then it will be reasonable to not to prolong conservative treatment and consider uh, surgery early on. So I'll explain why. Because redislocation rate after first time dislocation can reach up to 49%. So 50% of them may redislocate after first time dislocation. You can see the, 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 uh, there is a range of redislocation rates from between 17 to 49. So the 49%, uh, there are people who are, are probably younger, who have hypermobility who have multiple anatomical factors wrong with them, they will be susceptible to another uh, dislocation. While um, the, 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 the people who are on the 17, those are people who, ha who are a bit older and they don't have too many things wrong with them. They don't have you know, massive proprio dysplasia or patella alta or you know, uh, problems with the uh, uh, overall alignment. So second time dislocation is the serious one. When somebody dislocates a second time, then there is high level up to you know, two thirds of them uh, would re-dislocate. So it will make sense that people who dislocate twice to consider them for surgery. Patient satisfaction with non-operative treatment is very low, it's only 40%. And the return to pre-injury level after first time dislocation is again very low. After first time dislocation, there's 50% chance of osteochondral lesion. And it has been shown that if you treat those patients conservatively, there is 35% uh, of them who would develop osteoarthritis at a later date. Patella alta, is very high among this group, it's about two thirds of them nearly. So is, if you look at the trochlear dysplasia, again, very high. So something like 71% of them could have some sort of trochlear dysplasia, not necessarily uh, uh, the type uh, C or D, but they might be just having a, a shallow trochlear or even a convex one or a flat one. TTTG is abnormal in 42% of those patients. And I'll explain what I mean. Some of you might have heard uh, about TTTG and uh, already applied in their workplace, but it is the uh, distance between the deepest part of the trochlea and the highest part of the tibial tuberosity. And that is measured by millimeters and it is measured by superimposing scans on each other. So you can't measure them from the next way. You have to have a, either MRI scan or a CT scan, and then you do this measurement from there. In 58% of those patients, or people who 
have a recurrent patella dislocation. There, is, there are multiple anatomical factors wrong with them. So these are people who are hypermobile, who have rotational abnormality, uh, they might have a trochlear problem, they might have a patella alta, so there are multiple things. So, so the inaccurate dislocation, it is um, important, but, but in, in a subgroup, right, who are very young or have a strong family history or had the, the contralateral patella dislocation, who mm have -hmm. malalignment or malrotation, trochlear dysplasia, patella alta, hypermobility, one has to consider surgery early on so that they don't keep dislocating and they don't keep damaging the articular surface of the patella femoral joint. Now, the other thing you need to know about patella instability is that it is the, the um, instability is very difficult to generally quantify. Even with all the tests you do, such as MRI scan, CT scan, and all the Q angle and PPG measurement. So I'll explain why. So these are the anatomical factors we've discussed earlier. I did this uh, rotational profile CT for about uh, eight or nine years, and I measured every single factor that could potentially lead to dislocation. So femoral integration, knee rotation, external tibial torsion, TTPG, patella index, patella tilt, trochlear tilt, and trochlear depth. And other things you get from the CT team. And we did it in a very you know, specific way as uh, per uh, David Dujour, who, is, uh, who has um, been the person who designed this protocol. So the femoral version was measured. The lateral patella tilt was measured, the trochlear tilt or depth was measured, and then the anti-rotation such as this. So we measured various things and trochlear dysplasia. Of course, I've used Q-angle for many years, but then I realized Q-angle is not particularly useful. Uh, it's very crude. Um, and I also used TTTG for many years. And there are still people who believe that um, TTG, which normally is uh, 2 to 12 millimeters, but there are a lot of people who believe that 20 and above is an indication to intervene and, you know, do an osteotomy or realign the leg. But that is not strictly true. I, um, uh, the, the, the the reason I'm saying that is because we've done research on this and we have uh, shown that it is uh, the Q angle and the TTTG are both are unreliable for, to assess in the, in, the, in the process of designing the uh, uh, management uh, uh, flowchart, so to speak, uh, or algorithm for uh, um, stability. Now, the Q angle as you all know it, it's a very crude measure. A lot of people uh, measure it in different ways. Some people measure it with standing, sitting, muscle contracted or relaxed, and inflection and extension. So therefore it is, we're not talking about the same thing when we are talking, when we are measuring the Q-angle. Merchant, if you know him, he's the guy who described the merchant views he, um, he has uh, uh, designed a uh, goniometer specifically for the Q-angle. And for many years, after using it for many years, I believe the Q-angle is very, very crude. It's almost useless. But keep it in mind, in back of your mind, for exam purposes, you can say, I can see the alignment is changed or had done and that, or this will affect the alignment in one way or another. Now, the TTT G distance is another story. So this, um, the, the, the first paper described TTTG was in 1978, and it was in French. And this paper had three groups of patients. One of them were over 65. The second group had arthritis. The third group was the only group with patella dislo dislocation. And the, the quality of this paper uh, is very poor. 
it would never pa pass this stringent uh, uh, review of nowadays. So, but it has taken off. Now, I myself, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I've contributed to the myth of PPPG. Many years ago, we did uh, research on this, and we uh, suggested that if the TPGD is above 15 millimeters, then one has to uh, implement or use some aggressive surgery to intervene to correct the uh, instability. But I really don't believe that is um, correct nowadays, because logically, if you look at these two guys, you can you have a small guy and a massive guy. If you move the tibial tubercle five millimeters medially, you would have different impacts or outcomes in those two guys because five millimeters on the little guy have a different impact uh, uh, compared to the big guy. And also, the, we have the same problem. TTTG is measured in different ways. It's measured in flexion extension, rig bearing, non-rig bearing, ET, MI scan. There is, there is uh, the inter-rater reliability of three to five millimeter measurement uh, uh, difference between them. So it isn't as reliable as uh, people uh, claim. For the exam purpose, you can mention, you know, TPTG, you can mention Q-angle, but I wouldn't, you know, uh, think of them and be all and end all and uh, uh, swear by them. It is one of many investigations that help you in making up your mind at the end, but they are not the most reliable one. And of course, we've published on this and shown that the PTTG is not a decisive element in establishing therapeutic choices for instability. Now, with instability, you don't really have to jump on the bandwagon like everybody else and, you know, do what they do. You have to think for yourself what is useful, what's not. For the exam purpose, you just have to have an understanding of what are, what are the main contributing factors in instability and then, you know, how to investigate them, how to identify them, and generally how to correct them if you know there are different anatomical factors which are abnormal. And I hope by the end of this you would understand uh, how to deal with instability clinically and in the exam. Now I simplify things a lot because I think there is a uh, very little uh, uh, point on, of knowing a lot but not being able to apply it clinically. So to me instability uh, again, it is a, uh, a spectrum. It's not a continuum, it's a spectrum. So there are people who have a normal tracking. There are others who have slight mild tracking, but it could, may or may not be symptomatic. And then in that group, they, 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 something happens that leads them to decompensation. And then there, there are some of them may decompensate to an extent to have a recurrent dislocation and others may have nothing to do with it, it just be dislocated all the time. So essentially what I'm saying, there are a group that is dislocatable, there are another group that is dislocated all the time. They simply have two different uh, pathways in the the treatments which are available to us in stability. Now, this patient is an ESA type, and it is dislocatable patella, so the patella is sitting there, but you can easily dislocate it. This patient, however, is dislocated all the time. So, each of them would need different treatment. So essentially the first one would need a simpler intervention such as a soft tissue procedures such as anti-anthrite reconstruction if the other parameters are not abnormal. The second one would need probably three, four, five operations to correct the instability and I'll tell you what are those instability uh, procedures are. 
So we have, the, we have a tendency as surgeons to apply the operation we know to everybody. And that's what happens with in, in, in this situation where people suddenly start doing anti-athletical surgery and they start doing them on everybody. So I acknowledge that MPFL is important and it is, I've done a lot of research on it personally and before my dissection. And it is well documented in the literature. When you dislocate your patella, there is a hundred, almost 100% chance of the MPFL being ruptured, if not fully ruptured, they'll be partially injured. Now, I also, I've also published that MPFL reconstruction is a, it's a, it's a very good procedure. However, there are other procedures which are necessary in certain individuals. And that is tibial tumor transfer, mainly medially. And that is because you have abnormal TPPG, so you deal with them. But I will give you an indica the indications for that in a second. You could also consider trochlear, uh, a patient who has trochlear dysplasia, you should consider trochleoplasty. And very important operation, which is uh, not very commonly done, it is distalization of the tibial tubercle for patella alta. I think, I believe patella alta is a serious pathology and one of those uh, problems that cannot be corrected by just soft tissue procedure, you need to do distalization. And distalization is generally very successful. So, the treatment summary is this. So you can do MPFR reconstruction in probably 80 or more percent of the patient. And that is on the patient who has had a dislocation or MPFR rupture. They have a small degree of ulcer, small you know, degree of dysplasia, slight overall you know, hypermobility and malalignment and malrotation, but not severe enough for you to consider medialization or distalization. However, if somebody, and I in my practice mainly, you have to think about distalization primarily if somebody's alta is more than 1.4, 1.4 and more, as you do, you do your measurement, there are different ways of measuring patella alta. You need to know them for the exam purpose. There is a black burn peel, right? There is an insulus valverton. Uh, there is Catherine de Cham. Catherine de Cham is mainly used for stability. Uh, so it is one of those ones. But it's then talking mainly about distalization and the indication for it. And I, uh, did you hear me when I was talking about different measurements? Yes, yeah. yeah. So, so if the measurements of any of these indices more than 1.2, then you're thinking there's abnormality. And if it is 1.4, there is where you think I should be doing the stylization of the tibial tubercle. And if somebody has trochlear dysplasia, which is grade C or D, according to Henri Dijour, then that means when it is completely deformed, not just slightly shallow, then one has to do trochlear fasting. Distal femur osteotomy or derotation osteotomy are very rare, but occasionally useful if somebody has massive malrotation. Now, this patient of mine had more than one problem, so they, they, she was she was dislocated all the time. So, in order to put the patella back and keep it on the top of the knee. One has to do lateral release, medialization, distalization, either trochleoplasty and MPFL reconstruct, all of them in one go so that I can control the patella. So, simply, people who have a soft tissue problem, uh, mainly MPFL rupture, with some anatomical abnormalities, could benefit from MPFL reconstruction, and that is the, the group which are dislocatable. However, they, there, are group, there are a group of patients who have the patella dislocated all the time, then that group needs more than one operation 
all together to put the patella back on track and then keep it there. Now, the surgical technique for it, I'm not sure how much, if you are, if you know that much, I don't think you would probably uh, be asked about technicality of this in the exam. But, you know, if you're doing well, then people would ask. So the, the uh, surgical technique, and for, for ho those of you who practice this or see this in theater, uh, it is important that you pick the correct tunnel placement and not to malposition the, uh, your tunnels. Um, I'll show you how it works. I've done a lot of work uh, in the lab on this. Uh, um, 2012 and all that published in uh, America Journal of Sports Medicine. So the bottom line is um, previous research, which was done in the same lab by Andrew Amos, uh, uh, showed that the MPFL attaches to the medial epicondyle. But that is subsequently have been shown by myself and few people that it is wrong. It is attached to the, if you look at here, you can see the MPFL is attached to the upper two thirds of the patella and also to the midpoint between adductor tubercle and the medial epicondyle. So it isn't attached to the medial epicondyle as it was previously believed. Now you can see also where it is attached and it is relation to the shuttle work or shuttle point, which is a lot of people reconstruct their MPFL using the red dot, which is, we think, and not, it is not just me. In fact, today I had some communication from a Japanese surgeon who's uh, done a very nice basic science study showing that the attachment is in the green area exactly, not the red. So there is where it should be, the placement. And that point is, we call the confluence point not the cadre point, it's a confluence point. The reason we call it confluence because it is the confluence of two things, the human set line, which is, you can see where it's coming from, and the extension of the line coming from the posterior cortex of the femur. So those two lines, they meet at the point, and there is where the anatomical point is and we've done by a mechanical study to show that where it should be. And as it happened, that point is the center of the knee rotation. And the techniques are two, either you do a medial trough or bony tunnel or multiple other ways. You just have to apply the principles of uh, reconstruction. Now, the principles are not to over tension them and fix them in the wrong angle. Generally, uh, tension them two newtons, two newtons about 202 or three grams, and uh, at a flexion angle of 60 degrees. 30 is acceptable too, but the reason I'm saying 60 is because at 60, the patella will be constrained by the whatever groove. Uh, you have left in the cochlea, and then you are not going to be over tension in it because it is being buttressed by the cochlea at 60 degrees of flexion. Now, just wanted to say that the rehab of uh, uh, patellofemoral reconstruction should be just straightforward, just like ACL, getting them going quickly, no brace full weight bearing as able, uh, flex and extend as, um, as they can. And of course you go through different stages. But the reason I'm saying all this, because um, the tensile strength uh, of MPFL is uh, 208 Newton. So essentially, you're really not going to apply massive amount of force for, to, to the MPFL reconstruction. The MPFL reconstruction is necessary in the first 30 degrees. It just tucks the patella into the groove. So you really, you put in a graft that is uh, multiple times stronger than the MPFL itself. So these, the, you know, the 
the load to failures of a you know, semi tendinosis is much higher. So if we're talking about the core bundle, which is 4,000 newton, uh, so a single bundle would be less than that, but still will be much stronger than the antibiotic uh, reconstruction. Of course, here we are applying two bundles instead of four, so we'll be seeing, you know, uh, probably still about seven or eight times stronger. And we're reaching the end here. So I personally think post-operative brace are unnecessary for the reasons I've mentioned earlier. Uh, and also because they are heavy and comfortable, they get to skin problems and they have no benefit and they cause muscle weaknesses. Now, so the take home message here is that in acute dislocation, consider surgery in a very small subgroup, but the treatment of acute patellar dislocation is still conservative. And you have to remember that uh, when you dislocate your patella first time, there is 50% chance of re-dislocating it in certain group, not in every uh, individual. And there are also possibilities of damaging the uh, osteochondral uh, uh, part of the patella. Now, if you have a recurrent dislocation, it is wise not to delay the uh, surgical intervention and not to persevere too long with VMO treatment and sending primary physio because that will lead to arthritis. And you have to also remember there are multiple anatomical factors that leads to instability. So one has to be mindful of various uh, potential pathology. And we also discussed that it's very difficult to quantify instability. So you really have not to use your whip for the exam purpose. You, of course, for any exam, you uh, need to uh, make sure that you have an understanding of the different types of investigations and the use of, of them collectively rather than individually. I wouldn't rely too much on PPTG and Q angle in my clinical practice or for, you know, for theoretical purpose either now. So it is important to reconstruct anatomically, as I said, to the confluence point rather than to the shuttle point. I have to tell you that people do not dislocate after your reconstruction if you use the abnormal tunnel placement. But what they do, they will be tight in flexion. The other thing is they will be maltracking for life and probably will end up with arthritis. And the uh, other thing is don't apply MPFR reconstruction to everyone. And remember, you don't need too much force or tension on the MPFR reconstruction and you can mobilize them early with no fear. Thank you very much. That's our next course in, uh, in uh, uh, Hyderabad in October. Thanks to everyone. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you, Prof. That's um, amazing as expected, obviously. Um, I, clearly, I don't have anything to add to it. Uh, I think you very nicely covered the topic. I think this is um, a summary of years and years of experience, both academically and um, clinically. Um, I, I learned a lot, and I'm going to listen to this lecture again and again to consolidate uh, my knowledge about it. But um, I liked how um, you explained how the TTTG is not just a num number, it's actually relative to the patients. Yes. Um, yes. So, I, you know, so therefore, you know, there's no right answer, is it 12s, is it 20s? It's, if we put onto that the examiner in the exam that it is, it is a relative number and the patient factor, body habitus, that, uh, how tall the patient is, is important. That, you know, the examiner will then understand that we know we're treating patients rather than treating um, yeah, yeah. scans or... Um, I think uh, it is, if you just take... Uh, we're not engineers, you know, we, we, we deal with biology and we, we deal with uh, variation in, 
in height, weight, uh, you know, and sex and all, you know, there are multiple factors and can affect all these numbers. Uh, so therefore we have to just show the um, maturity of saying, well, I know this is, you know, being said, 20 is the magic figure, but it is, you know, it can vary because the measurement is not reliable and you could use yeah. MRI or a CT scan or, you know, and there is, there is inter-rater, uh, uh, the inter-rater reliability of these measurements is very low. So therefore, you know, it just shows you have an analytic mind, yeah. not just repeating what says, what is said, being said in the books. That's what exam is about, isn't it? And also, exactly. uh, uh, yeah. I, I picked up this nice spectrum you put of, of the patelliform instability. I don't think I've heard that before. And it's a very nice uh, concept. Yeah. So I think um, it's really a very interesting how you personalize your treatment. to depends, it depends on where your patient is in the spectrum. So there's no one right operation. No. You could do two procedures in one patient. You could do, as you, as you demonstrated, multiple procedures or just one. And yeah. there's a spectrum. So I, I really need to... Um, sit down later on and look at that again and uh, it's, it's very nice. very interesting concept Does anybody have any um, questions yes. no. so we have the, yeah we have yeah. how is the TTG distance is measured yeah. and uh, um, uh, I'm not sure it, it, would they ask this question in the exams or yeah. I don't know well, they ask all sorts of weird and wonderful questions <laughs> I wouldn't get I wouldn't get too kind of wonder about anything because people ask all sorts of questions the, the, the thing is, the, um, in the exam, you, you are, um, what, what, what we want to reach is the point that this person is ready to become a consultant by having a depth of analytic uh, uh, brain. I wouldn't say knowledge just because you could have the knowledge, but you don't apply it properly. So it is the uh, the depth of thinking, the analysis. The, the it is just uh, it isn't about um, in, uh, listing ten causes of this and uh, 12, 20 differential diagnoses. Definitely is not. And we, we can trying to avoid asking people these direct questions. It is about what would you do in this situation? How would you handle it? So if, if I ask you, how would you manage with somebody with instability? Of course, you have to have in back of your mind all the causes which are causing instability. But then you would say that I would consider if the patient is young, old, hypermobile, not they have, you know, rotational or malalignment or not. And then if they have a femoral antiversion, muscle weakness, you know, gait abnormality. So that just shows that you've not just, you know, learned about the causes. You can also apply them clinically. And I, that is a big problem with a lot of people who just, you know, I know a lot, but you can't apply it. And then, you know, what's the point of knowing too much, but can be confused with all that traffic in your brain. So the question was what, sorry, the... T -t -t so the question is how do you measure the DTTT? Yes. Like, uh, you rely on your radiologist to measure it for you or do you... So, you, you know, you have to have... Um, uh, first, you would do a CT scan. You don't have to have a CT scan of uh, the, as I've shown there, of the head uh, knee and the ankle. The TTDG can be measured by from an MRI scan or a CT scan. But what they do, they align the posterior of the and then simply measure the distance from the deepest point. I think I have a slide showing that. Uh, oh, sorry. I, can't go back. I think, yeah, one of your slides, yeah. Yeah, there was a slide showing how to measure it. Yes, you superimposed the two of them. Yeah, you have think, to uh, them. it's not going to work by... So you need a radiologist to work with you to measure them for you. There you go. So if you look at here, do you see it? And with the third image, do you see the slide? Have, yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. have I stopped sharing it? Yeah. No, no, you are still sharing. We can't uh, see. We can't see. There, there, there are three images. So that if you look at the first one, 
which shows the femur, the deepest part, they, they pick the deepest part of the trochlea, the highest point of the, uh, of the tibial tuberosity. And these are all controversial, huh? because some people say, is this the highest cartilaginous or the highest bone? So, you know, if you, if you are a scientist, then you, you start becoming a bit panicky. Yeah. So here, here is the third image here shows that they are being superimposed and that distance is being measured. Yeah. Okay. What you think, thank you very much. And, and is there a difference between doing CT or MRI scan or they equally accurate? No, they're equally inaccurate. Yeah. So, Inac <laughs> <laughs> equally <laughs> inaccurate. That's a proper way to say yeah, it. The MRI scan, then there is this problem because the cartilage on the trochlea and the bone, they don't match. So the, the, the cartilage may be uh, exaggerating or otherwise the distance. So uh, both of them have their own problems. Uh, generally, people use CT, but MRI scan could be used. It gives you an idea. I think what you do with a lot of investigations, these are one of them. There are other investigations you do, for example, for infected and uh, arthroplasty and those investigations none of them are on its own are useful but you have to take them all in context and in consideration so then you have this art of kind of guesstimating this is an infection or not here is pretty much the same you have multiple measurements you just have to decide at the end which treatment I could use to make a difference I put it to you that the the most important one is the, 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 the patella alta. If you have a high patella, then you're not gonna get away with just MPFR reconstruction. So MPFR reconstruction is good, and probably 80% or more of those patients, but there are people who have abnormalities and primarily the people who are dislocated all the time or people who have patella alta, they need more than just MPFR reconstruction. Thank you. I think there was one question about when to do soft tissue procedure and when to do bony procedure, but I think you already answered this. I've just it depends answered. on the etiology of the condition. What's what's yeah. behind it? I think I've, I've I've put it down as a as yeah. a like a cookbook, you know, the uh, a la carte uh, treatment. But yes, you know, in medicine that doesn't work. You know, a la carte treatment. I mean, you can. I think there was yeah. So you do a BFR reconstruction if you have a just soft tissue problem, tibial tubercle medialized or distalized, medialization if you have a very high TTTG. But generally I don't do, and a lot of people don't do medialization uh, on their own. Um, they do, you know, uh, you do distalization on their own, but when you distalize, you, you do the operation primarily for distalization. But if I show you as I, uh, if you if you look at I can't see it because there are a lot of images here. One second, here you go. So if you look at, do you see the uh, image with two screws in the? Yeah. To yeah. You can to see our it. right, yes. Yeah, to the right. So the image to our right, yeah. But at the same time, it has been medialized. If you look at the gap in the top, then it yeah. has been medialized and distalized at the same time. So, so that that's why we do distalization, medialization at the same time, but distalization is the driver here to, to bring, you see how different is those, you know, kneecaps, you know? So look at yeah. the back here and look but at the, so it's been brought down and the, quite a lot, yeah. being anchored because it is too long. Right? Uh, okay. Yeah. You have to anchor that. Okay. Um, so one more question um, was about the J sign also. Is that something you would, uh, Use clinical assessment or you experience? Yeah, I think I've mentioned that. Well, I didn't read it, but uh, in the in the uh, I don't think I have uh, put in uh, clinical examination. I I haven't. No, I haven't. Uh, but essentially, you, you know, for the for the exam, I think I'm not going to take it about that. I don't think I have it uh, for the exam. Yeah, no, I don't think there is. Uh, so in the in the exam, it is important if you see something, you say that, you know, I've made this observation and there is a J sign. J sign is, 
you know, it is theoretically, it is uh, supposed to indicate some uh, overall malalignment. Yeah. Malalignment means, in more technical terms, that the TTPG or the uh, extensor mechanism is not aligned properly and it is more naturalized than normal. So that's why the patella tend to have the reverse J sign when you are um, extending, yeah? So you mentioned that, but truthfully, I mean, it's not gonna change, you know, you, you can't just say, well, it's, it's, because they have gen, J sign, I'm going to have to do medialization. That doesn't work like that. Some people probably, very simpleton and they say that it's okay but I don't think you can just uh, immediately uh, correlate those two but it's a something you, you know you observe you mention you say theoretically it's a suggestion of malalignment of the extensor mechanism and may you know be one of those factors which lead you to choose that to realign the extensor mechanism. It's 21 hours. Yeah. But it isn't just, um, just that. You have to remember to do all the other tests, the clinical ones, and then... Uh, yeah. So beating score is important for the... I, I'm sorry, I, I had those slides, but I didn't put them in because I just picked this presentation from Eska last week. Yeah. Yeah, beating score, I think, uh, I, I think one of the things I could say is if, if in a clinical, maybe in a clinical examination situation, anything yeah. about instability, shoulder, uh, yeah. patella, anything, yeah, straight away check for the beaten. Um, yeah, of course, you have to check more, high, more hypermobility. Of all, yeah. of course, for the, in the exam, you don't do the uh, apprehension test uh, uh, with enthusiasm because that could lead to a problem. So it is very important that you don't, you know, cause too much pain or Clark's test or, you know, there, there, there are tests you do that causes pain. So you're trying to leave those to the end or ask if it is necessary for you to do them. Uh, but for instability purpose, it is, you know, it is just you observing cer certain things, you're observing their gait, you are looking at the hypermobility from the, the beating score. You said something about the J sign. If there is, if there is one, if the patella is squinting or um, you you see them there work, working with massive femoral antiversion, you have to you know just make a comment on those things. And um, believe me, none of the things uh, asked are difficult in, the, in our exam or in uh, anywhere else. But I think it's just the stress level is too high and people get a bit clusters and confused yeah yeah and we appreciate that i mean it is we time and time again we we remind ourselves and colleagues that uh, these guys are uh, i can speak for the uk exam it's one of the probably fairest in the world uh and i it's quite important um which you have to be wary about if you're going to answer in the exam um when would you uh operate on a first time dislocate or an acute patellar dislocation yeah uh, prof, um, I think I've, um, I've I think I've answered that uh, in a way saying that if somebody generally for the exam purpose you say I would treat those still treat them conservatively but there's a subgroup so the subgroup is we said people who have a strong family history who've had the other side dislocated people who have uh, multiple abnormal anatomical uh, uh, abnormalities there. And then there is those who have, for example, a big osteochondral uh, fragment in there on top of these things. So you really, at least you need to remove that osteochondral fragment. Mm -hmm. uh, if you went there and somebody who you know that there's 50% chance of them uh, re-dislocating. It makes absolute sense to do something about it rather than waiting for them to dislocate again. But it is all very much dependent on how comfortable you are with 
uh, treating this condition. So if you are somebody who does that day in day out, then it's fine. You can and and top of the you know the the removing of osteochondral fibrin, you can I uh, do an MPFR reconstruction or even repair or augmentation. But if you are you know if you are not comfortable, you can just do the removal of the loose body and then you know leave it for somebody else or wait till it is okay. Yeah. And that actually brings up the next question, which is, uh, I'm sorry, but uh, I think it's quite in the exam being prepared for this type of question uh, in pediatrics uh, situations. Um, is the management the same in these uh, cases? No, I was uh, I was asked exactly the same question, uh, you know, I have a first time dislocation. Now, at that age group, you can do a medial plication. Uh, what medial plication means is you use about five strong bone sutures and you can do it arthroscopically or assisted arthroscopically with a small stab over the medial aspect of the patella. And then you, you, you tie all these sutures so that you uh, imbricate the medial uh, side and that may make them last for a few years. Uh, if you did that in adults, after six months, it will all fall apart. It works, they work very well, but uh, I don't think it can withstand the forces of an adult uh, patient. Now, the, there are times you need to do an MPFR reconstruction with, with open physis. There are two different techniques. One of them you, do, you use an eye and then trying to avoid the physis, right? And the other one, some people try not to make any tunnels in the femur, but then they will try to just use something to a sling around the uh, adductor uh, uh, magnus uh, tendon insertion around the adductor tubercle, because that's one of the techniques. So people use that avoid but i have always done the tunnel and i have kept away from it by using which intense file and in the, the topography it's important that they know they they have a sound plan for the management of this condition and then some understanding of the you know the causes and the potential factors then the technicality of things that will take you to more than that thank you um, just uh, for everyone who's about to sit the exam in the summer, my advice is um, exactly as Prof has just said, focus on the management, the principles behind it. Don't get into the acute how you're going to manage the operation itself until, until you've discussed the basic management in your clinic, in the A&E and long term physio plan and so on. Essentially develop a, a walking plan where surgery uh, is your final option and you're not going to discuss the operative technique until we've discussed everything else around it first. Yeah. Prof Kader, you, you, in your talk you mentioned a few references and, yeah. um, and I do recommend that uh, candidates maybe they should remember these for the exam and uh, if they quote them if they can. You, do you think that's a good idea? No, no. No? Not necessary? No, I think I think there's a lot made of that, you know, you need to code this paper, that paper. Yeah, I think it is, before that, you need to know your stuff before yeah. you get the stage of putting icing on the cake. Yeah. So I think first thing first, you have to have an analytic mind and the knowledge to, you know, to um, just come across as somebody who understands what's going on. And then if you, if you know papers and you don't have to be very detailed about them, but if you know them, uh, then say, well, this, you know, paper from London or from wherever uh, shows this. Uh, but, you know, it's very important to be reasonable and uh, neutral and don't be radical in, you know, in things or rubbish in treatment. Stay, stay on the fence if you, not something I would do in life. Also, is there any guideline? Bit broad, know that no particular test is useful enough. And 
you know, just, you know, your measurements of the patella alta, you know, the, the trochlear dysplasia score, you know, hypermobility score, you know, that some people, you know, have uh, more than one factor. And then you have to keep them all in consideration when you are uh, managing this condition. You also know that MPFL is, uh, is a very important restraint to the, to the patella and the ruptures in almost 95 to 100%. Reconstruction is common. More than 80% of the time you get away with MPFL reconstruction, but there are times you need to do this and this and that. Thank you, Prof. I think uh, um, that's really amazing. I think, uh, you, you know, today 51 people attended. That's the most attended uh, event we had so far. Yeah. You have raised who is who are really very happy to step in and uh, take the challenge of teaching uh, all of us. Um, and we appreciate the time you put in into this presentation, really, uh, Prof. Kader, very much. And um, no um, I, th I think a very kind of you to offer Viva practice for us on a later day, not today. Prof, uh, for uh, coming to talk to us. Uh, really appreciate uh, what you said and also the uh, general advice for the exam. It's very useful. We look forward to having you with our group as much as possible. Hey, guys. Well, you guys have a nice evening. Thank you very much. For uh, thank you, Prof. Kader. And thank you, everyone, for uh, attending and uh, for all the questions that have been asked. And uh, we will um, see you again next Wednesday. All right, guys. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you, Prof. Kader. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.